cricket in Australia had reached new heights of popularity. The people voted with their feet. The fifth and deciding test match in Melbourne turned out to be yet another cliffhanger. I don't think you'll ever get another series in cricket where every test match in that series went to a complete finish. It went to the last ball of nearly every test match and every day. And um, I don't think that that will happen again in history. I think people still now actually talk about that 60-61 series, and I do myself because I feel that that was one of the greatest series there's ever been. And I think the public even realised it today that they still talk about it as getting back uh, people to watch Test cricket. On the Saturday, a world record crowd of 90,800 turned up to show their appreciation and support for these two great teams. The fact that that many people could turn up in one day, it was an outpouring of, um, of acceptance that uh, the cricket up to then had been fantastic, as far as Test cricket can be fantastic. Yeah, the fact we had so many people there I think was a reaction to what the whole series had created. Without a doubt, it was <laughs> tremendous. The roar and the crowd around you, and to play in an arena with so many people around you was fantastic. But when you talk about 90,000 people in one spot, then the first thing that you tell yourself, you cannot make a fool of yourself, not in front of 90,000 people. The giant fast bowler with his run of 27 yards is a frightening experience for any batsman, and Simpson has the unenviable task of facing this opening over. Anyone that says they like playing uh, fast bowling, I, I would doubt they do, I doubt their honesty. I don't think anyone truly likes facing a man bowling at 90 miles an hour. Colin McDonald, Australia's other opening batsman, ducks a bumper from Hall. And the crowd goes for a hold. Ah, and it's like lions coming down. Lions are ah, roaring. The Test cricketer plays better in front of a big crowd. Um, and uh, I was absolutely thrilled to be playing in front of my own crowd uh, on the Melbourne cricket ground. In front of, and... Uh, I think it brought out the best in me that was there. This is an atmosphere of test match heat and Bobby Simpson is meeting the full force of Hall's bowling. What you do get is enormous adrenaline charge and that I used to find early on when he's at his quickest I found him easier to, to face then I moved quicker and more precise at that period. Sobers comes on in place of Hall and the scoring rate quickens. McDonald and Simpson stage the best opening for either team in this series and together they take the Australian score past the 100 without loss. 90,800 90, turned up on that, on that uh, day in Melbourne. That was the highlight as far as I was concerned because I made one run a thousand and I enjoyed that. <laughs> Sobers breaks the partnership when McDonald is trapped right in front to be given out leg before wicket for 91. Easily his best performance of the series. The partnership realised 146. You all get the bat there in front of 90,000 and the place is electric, you know. It's, there's, there's actually no feeling like it. I've never experienced it before or since. And, uh, you know, to, to, uh, in, in, especially in, in front of a Melbourne cricket adoring crowd, which they are. And uh, to go out there, uh, the, the, the tension is so magic. And I don't forget, I was feeling that fine leg, and you had a young lady that keep hitting me with toughies, you know, every time. Sign this autograph. I said, no, when I wicked for you, do something. And, you know, I start signing autograph, and the crowd start to run towards him. And you skip a car and say, after the game is a better time. You know, I said, so we had to stop that. but. It was tremendous. Stobos bowls to Mackay when play starts on the morning of the third day. The single takes the score to 237 and Australia is only 55 runs behind the West Indies first innings total with five wickets in hand. Burge is the other not out batsman and Australia has a good chance of building a big score because the West Indies attack is restricted to only three bowlers. The pitch is playing easily and the West Indians have a problem with Ballantyne off the field and Worrell unable to bowl. During that time we, we had a rest day in, in test cricket 
and Val was playing on some drums. I was playing the bongo drums. But um, I never played bongo drums in my life. But I was there playing with this thing, I hit this thing nice. I don't know, he must have, he must have had a ball wherever he was. But he came back to the hotel and his, his fingers were all swollen. And at, <laughs> I wake up and my finger, my hands were swollen from hitting the drums and the rim of the drums, hit, you know, the joints. Myself and Gary did a lot of bowling in the first innings of the, of the, the fifth S. And I don't think Val bowled a lot. Australia, in a very sound position overnight, has slumped badly. And full credit must go to the joint efforts of Gibbs, Sobers and Hall. Sobers bowling his umpteenth over, Martin is almost bowled, and it's four more to the Australian score. Gary got five wickets, I think got, got four. I bowled about 40 overs, and Gary must have bowled close to that as well. This is a great sustained performance by Sobers, and he gets another wicket when Johnny Martin goes for a big hit. The ball goes to Kanhai at short square leg, and Martin is out for five. A remarkable recovery by the West Indians. Australia nine wickets down, and Sobers has dismissed five batsmen. That's the end of a long, uninterrupted spell by Sobers in which he bowled nearly 40 overs. When the West Indies batted again, they aimed to set Australia a big target. Smith plays a relaxed stroke, and the ball soars high in the air to land in the grandstand for a magnificent hit. When the last West Indies wicket fell, Australia needed to score 258 runs to win the match and the series. Uh, Shimo, yes, I went to Bob and said uh, in the second innings, I want you to go out there and take Wes apart. If it doesn't work, then I promise you I'll take the blame for it. But I want you to go out there and tear him to bits. And he did. Paul opens the bowling for the West Indies with Australia needing 258. Simpson reacts in sensational fashion. But I always worked on the principle as an opener. If they bowl one short to me, and it was particularly outside off stump, I'd go for it. Because if I got a top edge, I was probably going to get a four. So uh, it was just one of those occasions where it was getting tired at the end of the series. And he bowled a couple in the right spot. The umbrella of fur was up. I was able to lift a couple over. It was the, uh, the, the cordon on the leg side, a couple of square cuts, I think, and top edges, and suddenly you're away. took 18 runs off the over, and Australia has made a good start. You have a look at the scorecard and you'll see precisely what Simo did, and it got us on the way. And I thought that was very important in the context of the way the game uh, was going. West Indian captain Frank Worrell leads his team out on the field after lunch on the fifth day. These gay cricketers from the Calypso Islands have a serious job on their hands because Australia, with eight wickets standing, needs only 104 runs to win the match and the series. The final day's play of this remarkable series was a tense struggle. The result went right down to the wire. Every run is wildly cheered as the Australians draw closer and closer to victory. There's a great cheer for the West Indians when Valentine bowls Peter Burge for 53. Ten to make and the match to win. Three wickets to fall. With Australia still four runs short of victory, what occurred next may have had an impact on the outcome of the series. Now the controversial incident as Grout plays a stroke and sets off for the two runs. Alexander appeals to the umpire because the wicket is broken. The bail is on the ground and Alexander is certain that Grout has been bowled. However, there's some doubt, and the umpires decide to hold a conference. They rule not out, to the amazement of the West Indians, and Grout is still there. I was at slip at the time, and I thought he was, he was bowled down, because you could hear the click. The bail fell off, and the runs were completed, and the appeal was up, 
and the knockout came, I fell to the ground on my hands like this. And as I, as I was on my way down, I heard a shout coming from right across, mid off, I think Frank word was. And before I hit the ground, I was back up, like almost like a catapult situation, because I realized I'd violated the thing that he was saying, no demonstration. He got an inside edge and it hit also, went on to the, the, the stumps. And I was standing up there looking disappointed and perplexed. But perplexed because he hadn't been given out. Disappointed because it could have been put down as another drop catch. It was off an inside edge. But it hit the inside edge of, of Wally's bat. It clipped the stump ever so delicately. And it's decided a wicket. And therefore the bail falls forward. Very unusual. And um, consequently, the umpire on the assembly thinks Alexander's glove must just touch it because a bail doesn't normally fall forward. Where the stump was uh, set, the off stump was set, whether in fact even Jerry, who was you know, behind the stumps, had tread, trod on that crack and forced that to move, because you know, if you tread on some of those cracks at the old Melbourne Creek Grounds, if you didn't fall down them, uh, at least you're going to movement. So there could have been a bit of movement there. And if two runs were given, the two runs that were given to Grout, I think if he was given bold, I, I believe he would have won. As far as I'm concerned, one of the best umpires that I've ever played with was Colin Egar. I think he was one of the fairest, one of the best. And if he made a decision that looked wrong, it was a simple error. The two umpires, um, they were brilliant. And I, I thought that it was a bit much to have um, five consecutive tests, but they did really great. There were no national decisions. If there were a few mistakes and you get a few mistakes, they were genuine. I think it's one of those things that without the modern day replays and everything else, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't think anyone will really know. And this ball, he hits high in the air and he's going to be caught by Smith at Gully. He is. But that was the way in which the spirit of the game was played throughout the whole series. That Wally felt there was a kind of a discrepancy that nobody seemed to understand. He knew that Jerry Alexander would not have appealed if he had touched the stamps because things had gone so well between the two teams that nobody was going to do it. And he felt that there might have been a mistake, the ball might have hit the stamps and he was batting on the false pretenses. So he just throws his wicket away. And Valentine to Martin. Martin comes back, hits him in the air, he's got no, it'll be safe, it'll be safe. They can't get near it, they've run one. It's a tie. Eight for two, five, seven. The tie is facing Valentine. It's cool. Boys, and that's the game over. That's the game for Australia. The, the boys on the field now, someone feel of the ball. Whatever they do, the umpires are going for their lives, the players are rushing. <laughs> There are hundreds and hundreds of people on this ground and the fastest man on the field is Hoy. He's being tackled. He's through about four tackles. He makes the members stand. But where's umpire Eager? I don't know where he is. <laughs> They're all over the ground. As, uh, the players have dashed off. The result of this game that Australia have won it <coughs> on the final result of buys when uh, Alexander missed that one from, from uh, Valentine outside the off stump and Australia have won this test match by two wickets. Something that's unforgettable. Um, you know, it's um, Nat King Cole's favourite song, I suppose, but to us it's also unforgettable because out of all the series we ever played, there was never a series where there was such incredible cricket. And the kind of cricket that was played on that tour, I don't think I've ever seen it played before or after. And I've always think back as, on that tour as one of the greatest tours that I've ever played in, um, past and present. And I don't think that there would ever be another series like that 1960-61 series. The excitement was fantastic, the results were great, that tie was unique. But I think what went further was the spirit. I think the real spirit of the game. It set a standard, I believe, in, in sportsmanship, um, ability, uh, and certainly uh, uh, remarkable... Uh, there was a, a, something between the two teams which I, could, I can't explain to this day. I think that's the most um, rewarding thing uh, about that tour, that um, never before, or I believe never since, have people, team members, been able to make friends with people like that, that lasted for so long, you know. My, my friendship with the people of Australia and the various states, um, 
you know, will go with me till I die. Sir Donald Bradman and the Board of Control commissioned former Test cricketer Ernie McCormack, a jeweller by profession, to make a perpetual trophy for this and all future Test series between Australia and the West Indies. It was to be called the Frank Worrell Trophy. We one could only feel a sense of pride that to think that the Australians could name it the Frank Worrell Trophy. That spoke volumes, you know, and it told us the high esteem in which he was held. There wasn't an Australian player that would have disagreed with it being anything else but the Frank Worrell Trophy. That was that. It was, and we accepted that as, as, as the tribute for what was an incredible series. When you think about a foreign captain getting beaten in a series and name a trophy after him to be handing over to the winning captain. Uh, for us, it was, it was uh, an achievement we never thought was possible. But it did, and we were proud of it. The captain, I mean, the first black captain, I believe, we were waiting for something like this for a long time to happen, and to have this trophy name after Sir Frank Worrell. Well, I keep on saying Sir Frank, he was just Frank Worrell then, was a great accomplishment for Worrell and for West Indies cricket. And there is the trophy, ladies and gentlemen. And I know these boys are very tired because they've had a very trying match. So without further ado, I'll hand this over to Frank. Thank him once again. <coughs> for the wonderful performance they've put up this year and ask you to do the honours. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> this is indeed a very sad and happy occasion because the joint of the stumps this afternoon marked the end of the most sensational, interesting, and enjoyable series that any West Indies team has ever been engaged in. It also marks the culmination of a very <clears throat> enjoyable stay in your country. And we'd like to thank all those people for the very kindly letters and um, those of you for the lavish hospitality. <clears throat> I've got two duties to perform. <clears throat> I've got to present this trophy to Richie. I'd like to congratulate him and his men for um, the wonderful cricket. And secondly, I've got a little token which I should like to pre present him also. And firstly, Richie, congratulations to you and the boys. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a symbol here of a scalp. <laughs> Secondly, you can have my neck. <laughs> and you can have the upper half of my body. I shall refrain from offering the lower half of my body because the knees will, wouldn't stand him in any stead. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, Sir Donald Bradman, Frank, 
Ladies and gentlemen, Frank was kind enough to say that he was offering me a scalp and his neck and the upper half of his body, but I'm quite certain that you will all agree with me that he himself will remain in the hearts of cricket lovers in this country for many a long day. I would like to tell you that it's not only been a pleasure to play against our visitors and against Frank, but to play in a series as captain opposite uh, Frank Worrell has been a privilege. Frank was uh, one of the great people. Just think for a moment of uh, being the first black man to captain the West Indies overseas and the things he did and the way he did them. That was even more to the point. I don't know that you'll find anyone in the world who has a harsh word to say about Worrell. That also gave an, in, an indication as to the togetherness, how the two teams played, how the two captains reacted to each other and, 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 and how it brought back cricket back to the standard and the place where it should be. Two days later, over half a million people crammed into the city streets of Melbourne to farewell the West Indies team. The cavalcade was followed by a reception at the town hall. The sea of people, the, 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 the driving through this tremendous crowd of people, you know, it made you stop and think. Of, you know, what the heck have we done to, 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 um, to deserve this? And then, you know, they, they started to sing, Will You Nay Come Back Again? And, and it, it was so touching. Um, I think there were a lot of lumps and a lot of throats that, 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 that afternoon. But what I saw was a wonderful bunch of people who appreciated what a cricketing team from a different country came and did. That had never been seen before or since. It was a ma magnificent motorcade. 500,000 people came in the city square in Melbourne to say goodbye to us. I mean, that's the sort of um, accolade you give to Prime Minister's president and film stars, but ordinary West Indian cricketers, you know, playing that wonderful series. It was a marking point for me, certainly. The press thought that we, um, we, we lost the series, but we won the hearts of the Australian people. And I believe that's the reason why we had this big ticker tape through the streets of Melbourne, yeah. And I think they got a hell of a shock themselves to think that that's what the, the people of Australia thought of them. Um, I don't think in their wildest dreams that they imagined that they were, they were those sort of demigods to everybody. Uh, I don't think that entered their minds at all. I had never experienced anything like that before. To think that um, you come to play a cricket game, you're leaving, and people who are coming, looking through the windows at the, from the offices, and you're in this open air, open, open car, and they're waving and waving. It was, it was really moving. When we got out there, and you looked up, and you saw streamers coming from the top of the buildings, you saw confetti uh, coming down, and the streets lined with people, the windows, people peering out through the windows. You, 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 you know, I, I was a little shocked. And my mistake is that I I wear a suit, I should wear a, a jack, a overcoat. All the back of my coat was, was just lipstick and kisses all over and oh man, when they stop, people just run, shaking hands and hugging and kissing and oh man, when we got back to the hotel, I look at my jacket. I, I believe I got rid of that coat. I don't believe it could dry clean or anything like that. That's it, but they, all they were saying is thanks, we appreciate you guys being here. And it was very moving. One of the people I suppose that uh, I remember more than likely being more affected than anyone was Sir Frank Worrell um, because he knew that this was going to be his last tour to Australia, he loved Australia, uh, had a lot of friends in Australia and he was just one of those beautiful men. Oh yeah, he cried, cried like a baby, yeah. he was accepted, yeah, I think so. I think every one of us, without exception, but was so deeply touched by that. I don't think we'll ever forget that sort of outpouring of love and, you know, the, the feeling, well, boy, we, we have seemed to have done something for the Australian, um, for the Australian, for Australian crowds and for cricket. The West Indian players must have come here with some mixed emotions in that uh, Australia still had a white Australia policy and uh, they were largely a team of black men and uh, they must have 
wondered what sort of a reception they were going to get. Well, I think it was a proud year for the Australian people because they did throw away any racial tendencies that they may have had. Dr Barton Babbage, the Dean of Melbourne, and a strong advocate for the abolition of the white Australia policy, was moved to comment. It is a sobering and humbling thought that the West Indians, whom Australia welcomes as cricketers, would not be welcome as citizens. Their skin is the wrong colour. They may play with us, but they may not stay with us. It may be that the game of cricket will pave the way for more generous national policies. If only we could cultivate the spirit of cricket in all our dealings, one with the other. It is not far from the spirit of Christ. The West Indian players left Australia and returned home to their islands in the Caribbean. Like no other team before or since, they won a place in the hearts and minds of all cricket lovers. Frank Worrell retired from international cricket in 1963. He was knighted for his service and contribution to the game. Sadly, his life was cut short. A victim of leukaemia, Sir Frank Worrell died in 1967. He was only 42 years old. He was laid to rest in the grounds of the University of the West Indies in Barbados. It was a great loss when he died so early, especially to the West Indies, because by then he had gone into the university where he was a dean and um, he had already been making um, a great, um, you know, a, a, he'd done a great deal with the lives of young undergraduates in the University of the West Indies. It was so sad when he passed away at such an early um, stage of his life. Um, obviously, we lost a real leader. And they need leaders, and Frank, of course, is the sort of guy who could bring them together because he treated everyone the same. If there was a problem, he'd have a smile on his face, and uh, you can solve a lot of problems with a smile. And his smile was genuine. It wasn't a put-on smile. He was such a nice man, such a nice man. Frank's impact on the West Indies people first and West Indies cricket is eternal. He saw in these islands of ours the need for what I call a collective cohesiveness, a dynamic one that is shown in our cricket, but that's only a mirror. That also has to take place politically and economically in these wonderful islands of ours. The Frank World era it was one that symbolized um, excellence and um, it, 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 it made us feel that um, um, we were equal to the world in cricket, at least equal to the world. And so his mark, and both in cricket, in the West Indies and the West Indies people, is that of a prophet who saw ahead of his time what was needed and set in place. And his leadership was such that it, it survived him to Frank, to Gary Sobers, Clive Wide and the riches. And I believe um, Frank Worrell, or the late Sir Frank Worrell, um, did a lot for West Indies cricket. He has left a legacy here. And a lot of these boys riding on it, I only hope they take the time to read something about Worrell and learn about him because it benefits him, them right now. Legacy is the fact that uh, cricket became a better game from that particular series and from the things he did. You always need a captain to leave a legacy of some kind and Worrell left uh, one that just underlined that people who get onto a cricket field, should be a sports field, but I'd only talk about a, a cricket field, they should play the game hard and fairly and with good humour and to do things that um, make it for the future a better game. I think that's what Worrell did.
I have a number of homes in the world. One is Barbados, where I was born. One is England, where I have adopted as my second home. One is America, where my wife comes from. And the fourth is Australia, my spiritual home. I'm left with the duty of explaining to our people at home what this trophy lo looks like, what it feels like. <laughs> I should be able to tell them where it is and where it's likely to stay until we meet you again. <clears throat> <clears throat> Having played in this my 50th test match, I've never played in five more memorable nor more enjoyable games, nor have I and my team ever played against a finer bunch of cricketers than these West Indians. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our little ceremony, and I think now everybody can go home and uh, save up their pennies for the next series. Thank you very much. <laughs>